We're here tonight to talk about Rich Clarkson and hear about sports photography and, of course, the ultimate in capturing the human figure in action, in motion. So currently, Rich owns his production company, Clarkson Creative, but you might have heard from him from a variety of sources. Um, in 1952, a brand new magazine called Sports Illustrated ran its first image of Wilt Chamberlain, and that was Rich's photograph. So since every, his, his images have graced everything from Sports Illustrated, Time Magazine, um, he's been very involved with being a managing editor of the Denver Post, uh, former director of photography of National Geographic. Um, you could feel everyone in the room kind of getting, getting a little bit of jitters right now. Um, and I'm also very interested perhaps to hear a bit about uh, being president of the United States National Press Photographers Association. So ladies and gentlemen, good talk. I'm just gonna sit here. Okay. Okay, uh, the most effusive introduction I've ever got at, at one of these kind of things was from the, the dean of the Missouri School of Journalism. And it was during Journalism Week at Columbia, Missouri once, and there's, you know, like 500 people sitting in, 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 in the audience and in the auditorium there. And this guy gave me an introduction like I've never had before. You would thought I have invented everything from sliced bread to airplanes. <laughs> And it just went on and on and on and on. And at the end of it, he says, I am so honored to present to you Clark Richardson. <laughs> Which is among the various things I've been called over the years. <laughs> but it's uh, really kind of uh, fun to, uh, to see kind of grassroots place like this because I've been involved with with so many photographers that I first met at, at a really meeting like this. And that's not to say that many of you are novices or early career or whatever, because I can see that many of you are very solid professionals doing very, very well and, and very nice work. Uh, it's interesting for me to discover talent in, in various places and, and then perhaps be able to plug them into something that actually kind of works well for, for their career. Photography and, and, and my specialty, photojournalism, it is all about storytelling. And it, it is so important that, that photographers understand that what they're doing is not out there making elegant images, they're telling a story. And if you can make elegant images along the way, so much the better. So it, it's kind of like trying to make wonderful pictures all of which are attuned to telling a story. I've told people at our workshops over the years, okay, what, what is it you're, you're gonna be doing on, 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 on this story? Well, I'm, I'm gonna go out there and whatever I find, take some pictures. No, that's not it. You need to research it and you need to know before you go out and pick up the camera what it is you're trying to say what the pictures are designed to say to the reader. And then to understand, particularly in print, which is where most of my career has been, and, and it is still, it's so much of that is the same as, as uh, the internet. What it is you want to say, and how can you say it succinctly? How can you get to the point and, and make it work really, really well? Uh, it is one of those things that it just cuts the boys from the men. Uh, that, and, and nothing wrong about women photographers. <laughs> <clears throat> because uh, it, it, when I was uh, at the National Geographic, uh, uh, I ended up bringing more women on board than had ever been there before. And one of them, Sarah Lean, is now the director of photography of the National Geographic, which is pretty good. And, and Sarah is, is pretty good herself. It's been kind of an interesting time for me in, in a career that, in which I, I did a lot of original photography myself. Uh, I'm the only photographer that, that ever worked for one magazine and photographed for a different one. 
while I was a director of photography at the National Geographic, I still had a contract with Sports Illustrated to photograph basketball games, which I loved doing. And that was one of those things that Bill Garrett, the editor, and Gil Grovinger, the president of the Geographic Society, said, well, if that's what you need to do to be happy, go ahead on the weekends. <laughs> so it was what I wanted to do to be happy because I really enjoyed uh, sports photography. And, and one of the things that I probably enjoyed about sports photography more than anything else is the people that I met and the friends that I made. It, it, it's kind of interesting when I, when I start ticking off some of my best friends and, and people say, uh, you, you know him? Uh, yeah, yeah, that, that's, that's not hard. So it, it's, it's, for me, it's really been interesting over the years, like, Bob Knight and Mike Krzyzewski and, and you know, I, I could just kind of tick off a whole bunch of people that have, have become, you know, major accomplished uh, uh, coaches of, of national championship caliber. It has been so fun for me to do that. And, and one of the things that, that, that I've always talked about and, and, and always said and, and, and and, and, and that is, as a photographer, not kind of standing behind the ropes where someone designated where all photographers need to be, but I want to be inside. I want to be making significant pictures as an insider. And it's really been interesting over the years that if you present yourself well, if you know what you're doing, you can become an insider. You can get access to things that other people don't. It's really interesting because in the early days when I was photographing a lot, the difficult part was getting the pictures to the office. <laughs> and, and today, I mean, at the final four this last year, my camera and the cameras of our other four photographers were all hooked on the internet. The minute we would push the button, that image would be on the computer screen of Sports Illustrated in New York City. I mean, that, that's, that's a huge change from how it used to be. Used to be, you would be talking about the logistics of how you get the film to New York, which oftentimes entailed chartered flights, which wasn't all that bad. Because I, I can tell you that there's nothing quite like photographing a basketball game, going to the Lexington airport, getting on your own Learjet, <laughs> flying to New York, and, and the co-pilot is offering you a little Chardonnay or a little gin or, or the sandwich that they had made. And I'm the only passenger on the plane. And of course, it wasn't about me. It was about the film. You gotta get the film to the office. <laughs> so it's it's just it it is it has changed so much over over the years. In the early days, I was working at at, uh, at the newspaper in Topeka, Kansas, which probably not many of you would ever know that at, at a time that was probably the principal picture newspaper in America for a number of years, and and. We had Pulitzer Prize winners and, and Dave Peterson and Brian Lanker and, and uh, uh, Chris Johns. I mean, it, it, was, it was kind of the picture newspaper in, in America, which is one of those kinds of things that, that the reason it happened that way, there were lots of metros doing great stuff, but the bureaucracy of a metro newspaper and getting things in print and the competition all the time for this space in the newspaper, whether it be another photograph or a story or whatever an editor thought was more important than, than, than even looking at the picture to decide what was there. It was in those years that, that you had to really kind of scramble to not only sell visual communications, but to sell individual pictures from time to time. 
and to really kind of take care of, of the photographers that were doing something really unique and, and, and really wonderful. But you got to get the film to the office. And that, that was the biggest thing. While I was at the Topeka Capital Journal, there was a strategic air command base in Topeka, uh, Forbes Air Force Base, a SAC base with, with two wings of bombers and all of that. And as part of the continuing education thing, they had <coughs> uh, some survival training. And as part of the survival training during the last two weeks that all the air crews had to go through, they, they would take a, a group of these air crews, uh, eight or 10 of these guys, out in into a wooded area way south of Topeka, which, I mean, there's nothing out there at all. And it was their task to exist for three days. And they came with, with nothing more than what you would get if you bailed out of an airplane, which was virtually nothing. So they had to catch animals to eat. They had to, to do everything. They, they had to find out how to take care of the, the, their own staying overnight. They, they didn't arrive with tents. They had to make all of these things up and they had to do it all. And, and it was one of those really kind of interesting times that, that they hated doing it, but it was part of, mostly for, for them, they, how they might get a promotion. <laughs> So in the early days, that was all about getting the film to the office. And at, at Sports Illustrated, that was sometimes a Learjet. At, at the Topeka Capital Journal, it was not exactly a Learjet. <laughs> and so south of Topeka, in the middle of this whole exercise out there, the previous week, we had done a story in our newspaper about a guy that raised homing pigeons. And it was kind of a really nice page one feature story. And, and so now these air crews are out there and we're trying to figure out how to cover that. And our, our managing editor says, since they can't have any contact with the outside world, and we're gonna send our writer, Bill Weir, out there to, to write all the time, but we can't, publish his stuff, I don't think, until those three or four days are all over and everyone is, is back at home. How about we do something really kind of interesting? How about I call up this guy who we did the feature on with the homing pigeons and have them give us uh, three or four of the homing pigeons to take out there and our dispatches could come back by homing pigeons. <laughs> and he talked the guy who owned the homing pigeons into doing this, although it, he, did, it, he didn't think this was a very good idea. So he goes out there with the homing pigeons, with our idiot writer, a guy by the name of Bill Ware. And he's out there with this little portable Olivetti typewriter, and he's writing a story each day on this thin, onion skin paper, you know, then he's folding it 39 times and put it in a little capsule, which goes on, on the leg of the pigeon. Then he sends the pigeon off. Well, at the newspaper, our illustrious editor thought, this is gonna be fun, so let's promote this. So, the day before this was all to start, at the bottom of page one, he ran a little box saying, okay, it's going to be pigeon mail, and you're going to be seeing the dispatches from Oblivion for, for the next four days, and they're coming with courier pigeons. And we ran a mugshot of the pigeon. <laughs> so the, the, the first day, everyone is waiting at, at the home of the guy who owned the pigeons to where they went home, and no pigeon showed up. So the newspaper does a little apology on, on page one, and slightly humorous. And the second day comes, and the same thing happens. No pigeon, no dispatch. So now there's another funny little box at the bottom of page one, but now the owner of the pigeons 
did not think this was funny. And he was saying, uh, you're going to have to pay for these pigeons if, if, if something happens to them. And the third day comes, and nothing is happening. There's no pigeon. The owner of the pigeons is, is really upset. Uh, the newspaper attorney is now being consulted. I mean, this has turned into a, a mini crisis and, until about 6 o'clock in the evening. At 6 o'clock in the evening, the first pigeon showed up. Bill Weir, our idiot writer, had looked at this, at, at, at this little thing that clipped on the leg of, of the pigeon and said, well, that's not secure enough. So he took a whole bunch of tape and wrapped it all around us and weighted down the pigeon. So the pigeon showed up a day late at the guy's house walking. <laughs> Those were the wonderful times that you had and, 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 and a wonderful newspaper trying to be innovative. Uh, it, it was so much fun for, for, for all of those years working uh, at, at newspapers where the deadline was always there. You were trying to be innovative. You were trying to do something really special. And we had a pretty good staff. I mean, we, we had a staff of eight or nine uh, at, at the Topeka Capital Journal, which that, that would, the Denver Post doesn't have that many today at, at their newspaper, but that, that's another story. <laughs> so it, it, it's really kind of interesting, and, and it, as, as the years went by, trying to find the, the interesting things that, that would really happen. In terms of photographing, action, I, I guess I'm probably most known for basketball, although I photographed lots of different sports. Uh, did, as I think I mentioned, did Olympics for Time and Sports Illustrated. But at, at one point, I, I had done uh, 30 consecutive Final Fours. Uh, and so it, it was one of those things that I, I kind of knew a, a, a lot about basketball. And one of the things that I've always tried to do is not to just get a credential, go to the game, sit in the designated place, and shoot whatever happens to be in front of me. I wanted to make meaningful pictures, and I wanted to really concentrate on the people who were the significant people in the outcomes of those games, which in most instances is the coach. And it was in, in the years that uh, I, I really worked at getting to know the coaches really well to get unusual access to make what I thought were much more meaningful pictures. Pictures that no one else would see. And at that time, television was not covering it at all. I can tell you in the last few minutes before a major college basketball team goes out to play from the national championship, you could slice the tension in the locker room. And it does make interesting pictures. And that was the kind of thing that, that I wanted to do all along. I wanted to show pictures that no one else was doing. Everyone can make a great action picture of the game, some better than others. But I wanted to do something that showed our readers something that they wouldn't get any other way. And I can convince coaches that I could be there, kind of the back of the room, no flash, not making a lot of noise, and, and, and make those pictures without disrupting what is oftentimes a very tense and, and, and very intense scene. And I was able to do that at, at, before national championship games. I was always trying to show something that no one else was at and show pictures that no one else had, had ever seen before. I started out as, as a student at, at, at the University of Kansas. And at the time, 
the great famous coach, uh, Fall Gallon, was, was the coach of the team. And so at that point, in order to try to cover those games, I, I went to Dick Harp, the assistant coach, and Dr. Allen, and said, would it be all right with you if, if I were to ride on the team bus going to, to Stillwater or to Columbia or, or to Manhattan, the places where we were playing on the road? I mean, I was all, at all the home games, but I wanted to start doing the road games as well. And they said, fine, you know, we could do that. So they, they kind of got me all involved in the whole thing. And for, for three years, I traveled with the KU basketball team. And it was really interesting because in, 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 in a couple of those years, traveling on the road, my roommate would either be the student manager, Wayne Ladderback, or the number 12 player on the team, some guy by the name of Dean Smith, who went on to coach. So it, it was really interesting, the, the people you meet in early career, and if you leave a good impression with them, and if you really get involved with them in, in some ways, it could lead to all kinds of other things along the way, part of which, develops oftentimes into real friendships. And that's the thing that, that, that I most have enjoyed about what I've learned and what I've been able to do in, in, in covering sports for, for so many years. It was really pretty interesting because the first national championship game I ever played was made in Kansas City. It was the start of the UCLA street of the streak of, of 10 championships. And I was covering the game and, and for Sports Illustrated. I had previously done a Missouri Valley game and it was one of those things that you go to a game and so often everywhere you're looking through your 300 millimeter lens, nothing is happening. I mean, you're just saying, God, I didn't get anything today. I mean, it's it's terrible. On this particular Wichita State game I did, everything I was looking through at the time made a wonderful picture. So I, as we would do in all those years, shipped the film to New York, and the basketball editor, Ray Cave, called me back two days later. And he says, well, you've, you've, you've got four pages in the issue this week but uh, I want you to do all of our basketball for the rest of the season. So there I am, this, this guy from out in Topeka, Kansas. Sure, I was director of photography in a newspaper with eight other photographers, but here I am being called by the premier sports magazine in the country saying, you are our basketball photographer for all games. So I would take off on weekends and go do the Celtics in Boston or, or, or whatever. I mean, it was just, it, it was crazy. And it was one of those kinds of things that in those days, you would get the film to New York and, and then once you get the film there, then, then you get home. So sometimes they would have couriers. And as I mentioned, sometimes they would, if nothing else was available, they had a Learjet. So it, it, was, it was really kind of fun and, and, and interesting times to, to do all of that. So my first cover on Sports Illustrated was that game in Kansas City. And at that point, I had been experimenting with this for uh, a whole season. And the way that people shot basketball in those years was with a semi-wide angle lens on your end of the court. So I put a 300-2.8 lens on my other camera and would photograph the other end of the court. And you could photograph all kinds of things going on at the other end of the court with a very different perspective and a very different look. And on that first game I was doing it, that national championship game, I had a picture of Gail Goodrich, the UCLA point guard who had stolen the ball and was coming down the court right into the camera. Uh, and it was just, it was one of those things that was perfect. Now there's no autofocus in those years. 
And the reason that I got so much, so many assignments from Sports Illustrated was I could follow focus almost better than anyone else. So that was my first cover at Sports Illustrated. Gail Goodrich charging, dribbling the ball with the whole background, you know, the, the rest of the play in, in the background for essentially the, the most significant basket in the outcome of the game. So it was one of those things that uh, I kept looking to try to use technology, equipment in ways other than traditionally it had been done. John Zimmerman and myself, and we didn't know each of us was doing it at the time, both of us said, wouldn't it be neat when these glass backboards came out to put a camera clamped up there, looking right through the glass, right over the top of the basket? So, I had a, a, a bracket made that would be very secure to go on the standard of the basket to look through the glass backboard. And, and John was doing the same thing in, in Los Angeles. And it was really funny because it wasn't until a couple of years later that we actually met and got to know each other really well and, and, and realized that we both started doing that at the same time. And so it, at that point, I mean, today you go to, to, to a, a championship game and there's all kinds of cameras clamped all over looking through the glass backboard other than at the, the final four. And the NCAA doesn't want 17 cameras on there, so uh, our two are the only ones there. <laughs> but we pool them, so the, the pictures uh, are, are distributed uh, in the NCAA benefits to, to everyone that, that is really anxious to have them. And it's really interesting, as, as I was saying, we push the button, one of those cameras goes off, and they're wired. The image is on the screen in the media workroom instantly, which can be given away to anyone else that wants it. It's instantly on the Associated Press screen, and it's instantly in New York on the Sports Illustrated screen. I mean, that, that's a piece of... Uh, when we think about how we used to worry about getting the film to New York or Chicago, if it was a Chicago close, when you think about that, to think now you push a button and it's, the picture goes wherever you want it to go. I mean, that, that, that's a, a huge change. There's one little bit of a downside to that, and that is you don't want to push the button too often because you don't want that editor saying, what the hell is this guy doing? Oh. He's loading me with all this stuff to look at, and 90% of it is useless. Getting access was, was, is the other thing. Uh, when I was at Kansas, I could get access with, with the great coach, Paul Gallon, and was doing that. But then I was starting to do lots of other stories for. For, for the magazine. And, and one of the early ones I did was uh, a Kentucky game. And Kentucky in those years played in the old Coliseum. And the two benches were not on the sidelines, they were on the ends of, of the court. They had a very large apron, you know, like 12 feet before the seats for the, for the players and, and the coaches from the inbounds line. So I'm to do the game there it was part of a feature that we were doing on America's colorful coaches. And so I was going around doing colorful coaches at various places around the country. And Adolf Rupp, then the Kentucky coach, was one of those to do. So I'm there for the day of the game. So I, I walk into the basketball office before the game and Ken Kuhn was the sports information director and I, I think he was afraid of his own shadow. And I said, uh, Ken, I, I would like to, for part of the game, sit on that apron right in front of Coach Rupp in order to make pictures for this essay instead of doing it with a 300 millimeter lens off the other side because 
the look is going to be totally different. It's going to be intimate if, if, if you're there basically doing it with a 35 millimeter lens. And he said, oh, I don't think that would be possible at all. We've, we have never done anything like that. And I said, well, could, could we ask Coach Rupp? Oh, no, 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 you, you can't bother him. So I'm walking down the hallway and, and, and uh, passing the basketball office, and I look through the door, and here's the, the secretary and the assistant sitting in the outer office, and I could look right through the door and, and right back into Coach Rep's office, and I could see him sitting at the desk. So what do I have to lose? So I, I just walked right in, walked right past all these other people, said, wait a minute, wait a minute, and walked right in, and, and Adolf Rupp says to me, uh, who are you? So I explained to him who I was and what I wanted to do. And that little twangy voice of his, he says, you're just here to make me look like a fool and I'm not gonna have it. <laughs> I said, well, well, actually, Coach Rapp, uh, I've photographed you before. He said, well, you know, so what? I said, I, I photographed you with Fog Allen and James Naismith in Lawrence, Kansas, 12 years ago. I was just a kid at the time, and your sister said those people were at her house, and could Richard come over with his camera and take a picture? <laughs> so I did, and he listened to me. He says, I still have that picture. He says, that's maybe my favorite picture. He says, I think I'll be fine for you to shoot pictures at the game tonight, wherever you want to go. <laughs> so it, it's kind of really fun and funny trying to get those kinds of, of, of access to times. During the years I was in school, and for a number of years after that, uh, Kansas is my alma mater. I, I, I could always get access to behind the scenes. And people don't think at all that going to a basketball team's or a football team's practice could ever make a picture. And in fact, it can sometimes make the most significant picture that you can make. So for a number of years, I made a point of getting to lots of places early and going to the last practice before the game. And that does several things. It teaches you what might happen in the game, but it also makes really good points with the coach. Because this guy wants to cover me intelligently enough that he's going to show up before the game and to find out what we're doing. And I can't tell you how many times that, that coaches have ended up being so impressed with me that, that I would be invited to the team meal the night before the game. Would have all kinds of other kinds of, of, of contacts close in, which enable you to cover the event much more intelligently and significantly behind the team, behind the scenes. Pictures that no one else was making no one else was getting, no one was thinking of even asking for, which used to really puzzle me. So it, in, in all of those years, it was really kind of fun. Uh, but the bottom line of, of all of that is photographing basketball or any other sport is as the real estate agent would say, location, location, location. Photographing sports events, it's significance, significance, significance. A beautiful photograph of a player dribbling down the court who is the substitute who's finishing out the game with two minutes to go and has nothing to do with the outcome of the game but has made a beautiful picture I've seen so many pictures take that one in and say, how about this? But it has no significance at all. So everything 
that, that I've done over the years in trying to do unique pictures, the bottom line is significance. Okay, let's try a new place. Let's fly, try a remote here. Let's try something. Let's try to make it different. And it's really difficult because if you're covering a basketball season, particularly for a newspaper, and it's stretching for five months, all the pictures are starting to look the same. So you're always looking for ways to make different pictures. And in those years, I would go up in the stands. I would get behind the basket up high with a 300 28, looking right from behind the basket, but a totally different uh, perspective than you would get with a remote camera on the basket. Or I would go off to the side and get in the stands level with the basket at exactly 90 degrees opposite the basket and, and try that angle. I mean, I, I would try all these angles because the season is long and the pictures can get to look all alike. So let's make them visually different while still getting significant plays and significant players. So those were all the things that, that I tried to do in, in all of those years in, in covering sports. Significance, significance, significance. Thank you. A couple of questions. Yes, sir. Just curious, you talked about the autofocus, which I had assumed. I right. didn't know you were that incredible at uh, follow focus, but I could have assumed it from the pictures you had. But what about uh, the lighting? Because I know there was a point at which they started putting strobes up in the rafters, prior to which you have to have much higher speed processing films, pushing your, pushing your films. Can you give me a context on that? When did that change happen? Was in all those early years, we, we, for the big games for Sports Illustrated, we strobed them. Even then, uh, starting back when? Oh, that would be in the mid-50s. They were strobing then? Right. Wow. And the strobes were huge. And they, they would... Like yeah, and, and New York would send them out al along with Anthony Donna, who would install them. He would be there two year, two two years, two two days earlier, putting all these in, and and I, I would or whoever the photographer was would would get there the, the the day before the game, and the strobes would all be in, and we would have us uh, we would test the strobes get the exposure, try all, all of that to make sure that all of that was working well. And these were back in the years in which the, the television networks, and it was NBC at the time, were very apprehensive of the strobes going off. And so there would be negotiations and working with the NBC people like a day before the game to say, yeah, the, the strobes are going to be okay. And of course they're saying, well, wait a minute, we're paying X number of millions of dollars for, for the rights to this. I mean, we, we have the right to tell you you can't use those strobes. Only once in all of those years did we get to game time and I wasn't able to use the strobes. And uh, I had to shoot natural light and push the film two stops and that that was absolutely awful, and it made a cover. <laughs> but but in those years, it was dealing with with all of these other kinds of situations, in, including the, the use of, of of the big strobes. Then it got to a certain point that in some of the arenas, the, the lighting was coming up to the point. Everyone says you know it, it's the strobe, the flash duration, all that kind of stuff. No, it wasn't. I mean, what that was, the problem with, was mostly where the strobes would put, would there be a mirror reflection off of the floor into the main camera position? So moving the, the location of the strobes, not necessarily for the best lighting for my pictures, but in order to calm the NBC producers. So it got to the point that, you know, after a couple of years, 
their, their principal producer for college basketball and, and myself, I mean, we, would, we were friends, we would get together and, and we would work it out. But you have to work it out. And it, it's the kind of thing, I mean, it, it, there was a point in there that he wanted me to compromise all the time. There was a point in there that he started compromising. He started saying, well, that's not gonna be that big a deal, go, go ahead. So the, the logistics of, of doing it is one thing. The personal friendships and contacts and acknowledgements is something else. Yes, sir, you had a question? So it seemed like I worked for a newspaper back in the 90s, and when we went from film to digital, we first still shot film, but we just had a export to digital, and then later we went fully digital. But there was always a concern that we would no longer be photographers, we would be camera operators with an editor saying, yeah, go move over a little to the right, get me this. And what you're describing with sending pictures back and they're watching your stuff and kind of editing you or, or critiquing it, it sort of feels like it's doing a little bit of that. Uh, it wasn't that at all. I mean, because they trusted me on scene to be getting the pictures. And uh, the editor might say, did we get a picture of this or did we get a picture of that? Uh, and and they're, they're all watching television and they're trying to look at what's on television. They're trying to say, well, that, that, that's, that, that's probably what we need. The, the, the Final Four was in Salt Lake City once 20 years ago. Gil Rogan, the editor of the magazine, was there to select the picture. We hired a lab in Salt Lake City to process the film and then to be edited there. The art director was there to design the pages. All of that was being done and before the internet, all of that stuff is being flown to New York or Chicago. Chicago is where the magazines are printed. New York is where the editors are. But in this instance, the editors were all right there making all of those decisions. And it was re really kind of interesting to, to be in, involved in, in all of that. And uh, th there were several years at, at big sports events. The film was processed on site. The editors came there to select the pictures. The art director is there designing the pages. And back in those years, all of that stuff, the, the, the designs, all of that, that, that was in a fax machine. Remember fax machines? Yeah. Yes, a question. Dual faceted question. Uh, when you're hooked up to wherever in the world to immediately right. send your photos, are you sending uh, raw or JPEGs? And do they take much liberty in post processing, especially if you're sending raw? Because you can end up with really different photos aside from yeah we're sending raw yes. and because they need to manipulate it there yeah. I mean it, it's it, it's it, it's not something that that I or anyone could do I mean it, on site on that deadline I mean we're pushing the button they've got it yes okay. you were talking about Knowing the story that you want to tell. Right. Well, with basketball games, and I used to follow it um, when NC State won the national championship. I used to follow basketball games. When it's early on in the season, what kind of story do you think you're going to be telling when you're going to a basketball game? Um, do you have something in your mind ahead of time which you think may happen because you know the players or... You're familiar with the team? Or well, you may, but it's what, what you and the magazine have decided is going to be the essence of the story. Okay. If the story is really going to be concentrating on one player or a coach or something like that. Okay, so that's what you so, so it's deciding ahead of time with yeah, the editor. This right. is the story we're going to tell. But there were a number of times that none of that had taken place. So what I would do at halftime would be I would go over to the writer at the press bench and say, okay, what's going on here? Oh. What do you think is the most significant that's going on? So I, I would try to, at halftime, find out 
if it's something that I didn't see and didn't know and wasn't covering. And one of those, I was sitting at, 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 at a game, and I'm on the baseline. Way back to the Providence years, Ernie D. Gregorio, the great All-American forward, is driving the baseline and gets knocked right into my lap. And I'm holding the, the, the Hansel lad off like this, and he's laying in my lap, and he's looking up at me at a dis distance of, of 10 inches and said, Excuse me. <laughs> that, Did someone catch a picture of that? <laughs> no, it was, I, I, I couldn't focus at 10 inches. <laughs> what were you using the game format in, in basketball? Hasselblad. I mean, why? It's just amazing to me. Well, in, in, in those years, the, the Hasselblads with the big strobes were the ultimate quality. And then, 35, trying to blow it up that much in those years with those emotions, those ectochromes, that the quality wasn't going to be there. In any way, there, there's a huge advantage in, in those years, and perhaps in some other years too since, to having a square format. Because if you have a square format at, at Sports Illustrated, you got a chance to crop it vertical for a cover, horizontal for an opening spread. So you have options. So you're shooting the whole game medium format? Mm -hmm, yeah. Wow. Yeah, wouldn't be. A, a lot of those games uh, I shot with a long two and a quarter lens at the other end of the court, but mostly it was 35 millimeter at the end, uh, other end of the court. Just because the lenses were were right for the other end and other end of the court. Yes. So, so did you ever set up a picture with the idea of um, this is going to be on the cover and it happened, or is it you're just taking it in the course of the game? Set up a picture. So so, so it's like you, you see something and say, ah, oh, this is going to be this will be great on the cover if this one comes out, or is it? Is it well, that there's so many things that you don't you can't handle. I mean, it's just, you, you're prepared for everything. It, you, you think you know what you're doing, but you, you can't envision a specific cover. Right. Although I, I would really like to get one and, instead of the other SI photographer at the other end of the floor. <laughs> yes, at the back. Uh, can you show the camera good that you use now for any photography? Uh, use a lot of Nikons now, uh, and, and the digital Nikons are, 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 are really very nice, and it, it, it's, it's pretty good for us because at it, it, our office, I mean, we, we have nine people on our staff, and, and uh, among other things we do, we photograph all 88 national championships of the NCAA every, every year. So the one I do is always the final four, but we always we will have three or four other people there too. So it it, it it's all kind of like that, and and uh, because we do these workshops all the time, one of our workshop sponsors happens to be Nikon, oh, and Nikon sends. Uh, Ron Tanawaki and a couple of other people to each of our workshops, including two repairmen. For everyone that's at the workshop, they will clean and adjust their cameras, even if they're Canon cameras. They, they will take care of all of that. They will loan out uh, cameras and, and long lenses and wide angle lenses to everyone that attends the workshop. I mean, there, there's no other workshops in the country that you can come to literally without a camera and function completely and, and wonderfully with the latest equipment. So it's really kind of nice that, that, that Nikon has really kind of jumped into that thing for us. And they're, they've been our, our workshop sponsor for, I guess, 24, 25 years now, and do that every year. They'll have two people there and all kinds of equipment. 
and if, if, if you're a Canon user, they'll be happy to loan you a Nikon <laughs> to try it out. But they don't have Canon lenses for you to borrow. Do you miss film yes. at all? I'm sorry? Do you miss film at all? Uh, no, I've got a lot of it in the basement. <laughs> No, I, I don't miss film at, at, at all. It just, it did nothing but add another logistic layer of what you were doing. But I think the, the most fun thing for me over all these years is, is, is not the joy of seeing a Sports Illustrated cover or, or the feeling good about having covered something really well, but the most fun for me is, is meeting some really unique and, and and neat people, some of whom are journalists, some of whom are, are photojournalists, some of whom are writers, and then making friends with them, but making friends with a lot of coaches and a number of players over the years. It, it was, it, it's really been fun, uh, particularly as, as the years tick off. I mean, people that, that I knew, photographed and worked with 25 years ago, uh, I still hear from them regularly, so that that's that's been the fun part of it. <laughs> yes. Could you speak a little bit about um, some of maybe your your favorite things or least favorite things of some of the, the different organizations you've been a part of? I mean, because every photo photographer aspires to, you know, the championship game or um, national geographic or the national press organization. Do you have any fun fun or ridiculous stories? Well, there, there's a lot of fun, funny stories o over the years, but uh, I, I can't think of any in, in which I, I thought things went terribly and I was upset about it. I, I, I can't think of any. And part of that is, at, at a certain point, when I talked about logistics, everyone needs to be in control of as much as you can. Uh, and and actually photographing so many things, trying to control the pictures that actually get used, uh, and and that is it entails a certain amount of politicking, but also a, a certain amount of just bringing common logic to the editor editors, so that they know you aren't just trying to get something done for yourself, but you're actually thinking much like they are. This is one of the things that, that I've told young photographers that have come to work for me over the years. I said, okay, everything that I want you to do for the rest of this week is to think like a picture editor. Everything you're photographing, think like a picture editor, picking pictures. Then we would get to the end of that week, and I said, okay, now, for the next week, I want you to think about, think like the managing editor, what actually would get used, and be making pictures that are actually going to get used, and just think that way. Any other? Yes. Yes. Occasional martini. <laughs> I, I think the thing that, that's most fun right now is seeing other people that are on our staff right now prospering and, and doing good work, or people that have worked for me in, in years past see them doing really well. I mean, from 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 past staffs, you know. I've, I've, there have been Pulitzer winners and photographers of the year. And, I mean, it, it's, it's someone is supposedly doing a piece about our newspaper in Topeka, and it, it was like that—that that was the ultimate photojournalistic newspaper in, in modern history. And uh, I, I don't mean to be trying to get the accolades focused on me because it was all about the team. And, and we just had a wonderful team with so many people on that team that even after I left and they had left uh, Topeka, 
you know, really became significant photojournalists or leaders. So it, it's, it, it's, it was an unusual time and an unusual place. Well, thanks so much. Okay.